Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Old story, but in 2010, when I was involved in a traffic accident on the I-95, I-695 ramp in Baltimore. Traffic went from the speed limit 55 miles per hour to a dead stop around the curve of the exit in a space of 500 feet. And it had just started raining. I, in my Honda Accord, managed to stop literally inches from the person in front of me's bumper. I had enough time to have half a sign of relief before I was rear-ended so hard that the can of my tea in my waist-level console cup holder wound up splattered all over the windshield. I get out of the car and the person who hit me is literally crying blood. She is driving a Saturn that is at least a decade old and the ancient airbag broke her nose and plaqued both of her eyes. She's also crying for real because this is her only transportation. I go heck, grab an umbrella out of my now weirdly shaped back seat and hold it over her while she sobs. Explains her brakes have been locking up lately and she was literally on her way to the mechanics and tries to text her boyfriend to pick her up. She's crying so hard that she drops her phone twice. And then a cop shows up. Baltimore cops are jerks. So he writes this jerk a ticket about failure to control speed to avoid an accident and reckless endangerment. And half a dozen other bullcrap things to wear the ticket would literally cost more than a new car and she might get her license revoked then slash or jail time. She's hysterical. I talk to her, reassure her it's not her fault and manage to swap insurance information. Fast forward two months, I had mild whiplash, but I am healed up and mostly good regarding the accident. I have a new car and everything. I get a notice in the mail that I am requested to be a witness for this poor girl's trial for her ticket. Don't have to show, but it would be nice. Screw it if I'm gonna let that cop roast her. I was asked, so I am taking a day off work to show up. I turn up in court dressed to my civil servant best, who was working for the state government at the time, so however stayed you imagine, multiply by three, and even toss on some makeup to impress the judge. I wait three hours for her hearing, because hell if I'm gonna accidentally be late. The cop goes first, making up a bunch of bullcrap about how recklessly she was driving to have hit me in an accident, he was probably 10 miles away from witnessing from his response time. Then a judge calls me and I stand up. A cop looks, this weird combo of the surprised Pikachu meme and pissed, like he didn't expect me to show. Poor girl was already crying and started crying more. So I get to the stand, get sworn in and tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So I say that we were going exactly the speed limit. I know because I checked my speedometer in surprise that there wasn't more traffic. That she was following a proper distance behind me because I checked my rear view mirror and she was a ways off. That it had just started raining after a dry week so the road was so greasy and I knew that because I'd almost slid into the car in front of me. Only saved by my car's ABS. That her wheels had locked because I'd heard the screech and seen the skid marks. And that she definitely wasn't at fault. Because she was on her way to get her car's old ABS fixed. And I mentioned that the cop didn't show up until 20 minutes later. I know this sounds like an, an everyone clapped moment. But the judge did thank me for doing my civic duty and turning up. And I got a quick hug from the poor girl after the judge dismissed her charges. Anyway, Baltimore cops are jerks and if you can turn up in court to find a traffic ticket, even someone else's, you should do so. Two years ago, a new family moved into our quiet little neighborhood and began their reign of terror. We've lived here for over 20 years in this neighborhood and except for these past two years, it's been wonderful. I love our neighbors, except this family. This family just sucks. I'm not even sure where to begin. They are loud, they are dirty, they are obnoxious, their dog barks at all hours, and they constantly yell at each other. 
They throw parties well into the night, they steal my older neighbor's paper, and they actually train their Rottweiler to fetch the neighbor's paper. Impressive, but wrong. They throw their dog's poo into other yards. Ah, so much. They even got my 80-something-year-old neighbor's prized roses for themselves. Who does that? There are about a hundred issues I could write about in how we've all dealt with them, but this past weekend what was my good glorious take on it all. Oh, and yes, we tried talking to them, we tried inviting them over, we've done nice things for them, and all we've expected is that they act like decent neighbors. That's never happened. In our neighborhood, parking is scarce. Most of these homes are classic 95s with single lane driveways and parking is limited even on a street. There is a busy road a few blocks away that has a great nightlife and popular restaurants which means that at times, especially on the weekends, the street can fill up. This family has four drivers and five vehicles with only enough space for two in their driveway at a time. Constantly, they would park and leave their vehicles for days and sometimes weeks in front of other homes. Sometimes, leaving their driveway empty for no reason was all of their cars parked on a road. I kind of believe that in itself isn't that big of a deal except for how and when they would do it. They were intentional about it all, would do so to try and cause the most grief with everyone. And this went on for months, a complete screw you to everyone. After months of this and no one retaliating or giving them the satisfaction of how pissed we all are, they started parking deliberately in ways to make it difficult to get out of our driveway. I had to have my husband come out most mornings to guide me so I wouldn't hit their car as I backed out of my own driveway. There were also times where they squeezed my neighbor's car on the street to where they couldn't get out. Finally, an older, retired neighbor goes down to city slash police station and inquires about what to do. They found a code or law stating that so much space from the sides of driveways and yada 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 is required. So, we come home one night to freshly painted yellow curbs outlining every house surrounding this one. A few weeks ago, my husband's car broke down and he had to get towed. On his way back, he starts talking with the tow truck driver about these jerk neighbors and their cars. He tells my husband that if these cars are parking illegally, we should call the non-emergency line and if they receive a ticket, to call him and he can tow them at the owner's expense. It's the law. My husband and he keep talking and even meet up for a beer a few nights later. They are big fans of the Blazers. Brip City. He is a really good guy. About a month ago, we met a couple in our Fair city and it just so happens that the husband is an officer. We were already planning on meeting that Friday night when we met Thai brother jerk neighbors and their parking. He says that he will drive through on his shift if he gets time and if he sees them parked in the yellow, he has no problem ticketing them. Great. He also gets some of his friends to check it out when they have time to. Fantastic. We've been calling almost daily at this point about their cars parked illegally but nothing was happening. That Saturday night, he sent me a text saying he ticketed three cars. I missed that text, so no tow truck. But I kind of figured, with the three tickets, they would get the idea. They didn't. Off and on, all week, it was the same. This past Saturday, the teenage son threw a party and everyone, I mean every single one of their guests sent them, parked in the yellow of someone's driveway or plucked someone out altogether. Obviously, the little jerk told all of his friends to pluck our driveways or pluck our cars in. I sent a text to our officer friend who told me to call a non-emergency line and he'd be the one to look into it. But I'm scheming bigger. I call up the tow truck driver and tell him that there are at least 15 cars parked legally and are all about to receive parking tickets for parking driveways and cars. I let him know we are friends with an officer, and he and I scheme a little further. We get a solid plan. I call our officer friend back and tell him our plan, and I also mention that the party is likely going to be filled with underage drinkers. 
Now, I hate busting parties, but I make exceptions for little jerks and especially little underage drinking and driving jerks. He and I finalize the plan. Here is how it all went. Officer and three of his partners go through the neighborhood sighting all of the cars. Meanwhile, our tow truck driver friend has assembled a group of drivers in a nearby grocery store parking lot. My husband and I made an anonymous call about the possible underage party. The tow truck drivers start at the end of our street grabbing the car as quickly as possible. A few alarms here and there but no way could they hear it in this party. When they approach the house, my husband makes an anonymous call about an underage party in our neighborhood. Conveniently, our officer friend just so happens to still be in the neighborhood, so he and his partner go over to the house to check on it. As they knock on a door, lights go out, music shuts off, and the house goes quiet. At this moment, the tow trucks come in and are now towing the remaining five cars right from in front of their home. I just wish I could see the kids' faces inside as they are all having a dilemma about what to do. Do they go out and bust themselves for underage drinking and try to stop their cars from being towed? Or do they just sit and buy the bullet and watch $250 plus dollars go down the drain? On Sunday, they had three cars returned from being towed and all three were parked just shy of the yellow lines. I'll call this a win. My husband and a couple of neighbors also spent Sunday putting up some new cameras. They were all very giddy and loud about it all. Something about all the lights and police on Saturday made them nervous. LOL. Edit. For the threats against me for busting the underage party, how did you skip right over? As they knock on a door, lights go out, music shuts off, and the house goes quiet. Nothing happened to the kids at the party other than them watching their cars get towed off. In America, the police can't just go into a home without a warrant. If the kids aren't opening their door or inviting the officers in, there is nothing the police can do other than stand outside. It all went down right in the heart of downtown, where peace was about to get shattered with a sonic boom of a Karen in a full meltdown mode. I was there just minding my own business waiting for a friend. Little did I know I was about to witness something that would redefine my understanding of the word drama. So there I was, leaning against a lamppost, scrolling through my phone, killing time. That's when I heard the unmistakable sound of high heels clicking furiously on the pavement. Enter Karen. Stage right, marching towards her car with the confidence of someone who's never been told no. You could spot the entitlement aura from a mile away. She stops dead in her tracks when she sees a bright orange parking ticket slapped on her windshield. And that's when the storm began. Can you believe this? She screeched, looking around for an audience. I pretended to be deeply engrossed in my phone, but I was all ears. Karen stormed over to the nearby patrol car where two officers sat inside. Probably as unaware as I was of the hurricane approaching, she started banging on their window, waving the ticket like a flag of war. The officers, looking bewildered, rolled down their window. What seems to be the problem, ma'am? One of them asked with a patience that was nothing short of heroic. This, this is a problem. Karen shrieked, shoving the ticket in the officer's face. I was only gone for a minute. And you dare ticket me? Ma'am, you were parked in a no parking zone. It's clearly marked. The officer replied, calm as a monk. I don't care. I demand you remove this ticket immediately. And I will make sure your superiors hear about this. When it became clear that her demands were going nowhere, Karen's fury escalated. She ripped the ticket to shreds, letting the pieces flutter to the ground like confetti of rage. But she didn't stop there. No, Karen was on a mission to leave her mark. Quite literally. She kicked the patrol's car door with the force of a thousand entitled Karens. Then, in a move that would make a WWE wrestler proud, she grabbed the side mirror and pulled until it snapped off. The scene unfolded in slow motion for me. The officers, momentarily stunned by this brazen act of vandalism, quickly sprang into action. They rushed out of the car, but Karen was not going down without a fight. She actually tried to grab one of their guns while they were trying to arrest her. It was like watching a scene from a Wild West movie, except the outlaw 
with a middle-aged woman with a designer handbag. Ma'am, stop. You're under arrest. The officer yelled, wrestling to keep his gun away from her. I will not let you oppress me. Karen yelled back. Thankfully, the officers managed to subdue her before things escalated any further. Handcuffed and still shouting about injustices and lawsuits, Karen was led away to the patrol car. Well, I was left of it. The crowd that had gathered was shocked and entertained. Some were filming, others were shaking their heads. As for me, I was just glad my friend hadn't showed up yet. He would never have believed this story without seeing it for himself. As Karen disappeared into the backseat of another patrol car, the crowd began to disperse. The excitement over. I texted my friend, you won't believe what just happened. With the full knowledge that even with my detailed account, the sheer absurdity of Karen's meltdown was something he had to see to believe. So basically, myself, my middle cousin and my mother suffer a genetic disability. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Type 3. Now, this means we have certain needs. My mom used to work in an office job, which for the sake of the company privacy, we will call them TJ. I was never really clear on what her job was, nothing special since most of the time her office team had a lot of nights out and posted office pranks on Facebook. But it was something to do with computers, handling data and technology, taking phone calls and so on. TJ was not a huge company. I mean, the building was huge and very modern, but they didn't have much money. They lived on a road where there was a rundown, abandoned bar, a company that got shut down and had been trying to sell the building for two years and a small mechanic's garage. So you can imagine the financial situation. Anyway, the company was well aware of my mom's disability and the fact that she was working two other jobs at the time. She was a single mother of a disabled child and struggling to make ends meet. And the pay from all three jobs were just barely cutting our bills. However, whenever my mom made a request to have a day off due to sudden sickness or a hospital appointment or certain equipment to make her hours more bearable, they rarely allowed her. One time she asked for a certain type of chair that was made for people with C-shaped backs like us. She even said she'd settle for a cheaper chair that just had a softer back and they denied it. Saying she could manage without, she was sitting for 7 hours 4 days a week and they couldn't even make the seating more comfortable. Then, when a receptionist, who was completely able-bodied, made a request for comfier seating, her needs were met without question. My mom was understandably angry and made a complaint to which they replied that they would need a doctor's note that said she needed better seating, which the receptionist had not needed to send then. However, my mom went out of her way to get a doctor's note and they got her a chair in the end, although it was a much although it wasn't much better than before. Countless times when she asked to leave early for hospital appointments, she was told she would have to reschedule the appointments. She ended up missing a lot of appointments due to this. And whenever she said she couldn't come in because I was sick slash I was paralyzed due to my disability, which sometimes happens and is excruciating, anyone who has experienced this knows what I mean. She was told to get a babysitter or tell my dad to catch a train down. He lived almost an hour car journey away and look after me. My mom hated this job, but she couldn't leave. Eventually, she got a lawyer involved. She told him everything that had happened with any receipts she could provide. She also was best friends with her team's boss, who defended her in the court case. They went over everything that they could do. She could sue the company for damages, she was told, and so hatched a plan in her mind. She thought long and hard and found receipts for any instances she could find. She was examined by doctors for any changes or conditions that were developed because of the office job. She had developed several conditions that permanently changed her body. She asked friends and she even brought up old emails and letters. Eventually, they had enough to sue for 2,500 pounds in damages, and they won. My mom quit that job and started working instead at a local salon as a hairdresser, which was her occupation before she got pregnant. And after that shut down, she became a self-employed hairdresser and spray tanner, which she had to quit because due to the office job, 
She had developed boots in the air disease and could do either of them. As of now, she's working for a really rich guy who pays her a couple hundred quid to drive around and drop his products off to clients in other cities. She commonly does a three-hour drive every other night for 400 pounds up front. And he even pays her to bring him alcohol since he lives next to his Muslim mother who doesn't let him drink. She also gets help from her electrician boyfriend on the bills since he lives with us. I worked for a company for 14 years. I loved working there for 12 of those years. There were two main parts to the job. The first part was the sales side of things. This was away from the office and the customer's location. This involved quite a bit of driving and on a couple of occasions flying aboard to work face-to-face -face with the customers to deliver a high-quality product. We were in the cheapest, but we were the superior product. And I was the best employee when it came to delivering the product. I constantly got rave views from customers for my personal style when it came to delivering the product and executing the customer's vision. I got a huge amount of Rebbe business and I got a lot of new business through word of mouth with customers recommending the company based on their experiences with me. The second part was the office side. This was my weaker side. I hated cold calling potential customers with numbers I found in the phone book. When it came to answering the phone and speaking to potential customers who initiated contact with us, I was fine. But I wasn't great at making the calls. This was my only real not great part of my job. So in the office, I wasn't asked to make any calls. Instead, I prepared the product, designed a new product, trained new staff members, which ended up being one of the biggest parts of my job. I was also the problem solver, helping out whenever and wherever, filling in for sick employees whenever I could. I liked the owner and I liked the manager. I liked all the staff who were around me. All in all, it was a great job that I was really good at and took pride in. The company had been doing so well that the owner had slowly expanded over the 12 years since I started working for company. I had joined about three months after he started, so I've been a part of this expansion. I worked out of my nearest office, but often traveled to other areas to train their staff. I was loaned out, as it were, to other companies to help train their staff. At one point, I was a guest lecturer at a university teaching medical students how to deliver complicated explanations to people who don't have the base knowledge that you yourself do. After 12 years, I was on a decent salary, not massive, but I was happy. The new owner decided to sell off part of the company. He was selling the area where my local office was. He told me he would love for me to remain as his employee, but I would need to work from a different office. This would either require me to move or quadruple, at a minimum, my daily commute. The other option was to remain working from my current office, but with a new boss. I chose the second option. Before the other new owner bought the company, she worked alongside the staff for a couple of weeks to see how we operated. This was before any of us knew she was about to buy the company. As far as we knew, she was just another employee, and she was shadowing us to learn. She came with me on assignments in the field and saw my abilities. When a sale was announced and we were informed that she was a new owner, Everyone was very surprised. She made some sweeping staff changes. The manager left to start her own business since the new owner was also going to be the manager. A lot of the staff were let go. The secretary, myself, and a couple of new hires were kept on. The new hires were on the lowest wages, not salaries. Anyone who had got to a decent level was let go. Since almost everyone was on a zero hours contract, she was able to do this. While it's technically it was a new company for the customers, it was the same old business. This company still had the same trading name. The only real difference was that there was a new owner and the registered business name was now different. As far as the customers were concerned, nothing had changed. My job for the first few months after the sale was to train up the remaining staff to replace the more experienced staff members who had been let go. I recommended a couple of new hires who I had experience working with in the past. I was open and honest with the owner. 
I let her know that one of them was a close friend and one of them was my girlfriend. Both were more than qualified for the work and both were happy to join. My friend had recently come back to the country after a year of traveling. Whilst my girlfriend could only work during school holidays, she worked in a school and the owner gave them both interviews, then hired them, since we needed the staff. Over the next two years, business started to fall. The reason was simple. The new owner decided to try and maximize profits by increasing prices whilst decreasing the quality of the product. For newcomers, this was unnoticeable. They just thought we were expensive and the product wasn't the best. But for old customers who had been with us for 10 plus years, they immediately noticed. They were being charged more and were receiving less and worse quality. So the owner doubled down and increased prices again. 95% of our old customers left us. New customers almost never became repeat customers. Complaints skyrocketed. Whilst all this was going on, our staff turnover rates was ridiculous. People left after a few months when they realized that the minimum wage they were being paid wasn't worth it. Under the old owner, the average hourly wage for new employees was around two and a half times the minimum wage. This made people care about their jobs and want to keep them. My girlfriend quit, my friend remained but was looking for something new. Then I got a phone call. The owner needed me to come to the office. This was unexpected. I had just finished working on location with a customer. My next customer was in two and a half hours. It was a half hour drive away. The office was about an hour and 10 minutes away from both locations. If I drove back to the office, I would have about five minutes in the office before leaving. My mileage was paid above my regular salary, so I was saving the company money by doing this. Also, parking was a nightmare around the second location, so I intended to get there as early as possible to find parking. Then read a book. The manager didn't care. She needed me to return to the office. So I did. I arrived back to be handed a letter by the owner. It was informing me of a disciplinary meeting to take place in a couple of days' time. I could bring a witness along if I so desired. This knocked me for six. I was the best employee. I read through her list of complaints about my performance and started working on my defense. At the meeting, I declined to have a witness. Instead, I decided to record the audio of the entire meeting on my phone without informing her. Where I live, this is legal and I didn't need consent. The boss witness was her friend who she had met at yoga and hired for an office role, firing the secretary who had been there long before the takeover. Every point she raised, I could counter. They arranged from the week, you were unavailable to work for a week in August. Well, I booked a week's holiday so I could attend my cousin's wedding on the other side of the country and turn it into a holiday. To the pathetic, you were late for work on 12th of May. Is that the day my car broke down and I called the office to let you know? I don't know. I do. Here is a receipt from the garage dated May 12th. To the downright lies. This one, I can try it as a quote. Basically, she accused me of gross misconduct for breaking health and safety laws in a way I was delivering a product for a customer. I had broken health and safety laws. I knew exactly what I was doing since, as I've mentioned already, I have been doing this for 14 years at this point. She had witnessed me do this on multiple occasions and had never mentioned it before, because it wasn't an issue. She even had me train staff in this specific delivery method, because it wasn't an issue. She finished her list by telling me that she doesn't want to lose me, but she just can't justify keeping such a poor employee in my current salary. I had two choices. I could either sign a zero hours contract and work for minimum wage, or she could fire me with two weeks notice. I countered that she would have to give me 12 weeks notice, since my contract guaranteed me one week's notice for every year of employment, up to a maximum of 12. She argued that I had been only her employee for two years, since before then I worked for the previous owner. I informed her that with how the business takeover had run, it counts as continuous employment. I quoted the exact law and code that backed me up. She asked for a 30 minute break in a meeting to let me think about her offer. She went to call her lawyer. When she came back, 
She informed me that, since she was firing me for gross misconduct, she didn't have to give me any notice at all. If I wanted to remain and move to the zero hours contract, I could do that today. But if I didn't, then she would have to fire me. But because she was nice, she would give me a two weeks notice. I asked for a couple of hours to go home and think about this, and she allowed it. I knew the reason she wanted me to remain for at least the two weeks was because one of our few remaining bigger customers was said to have a product delivery from me at that time. They would only work with me. The owner had tried sending other staff in my place on several occasions, and each time there had been problems. It wasn't the staff's fault, it was just a very difficult delivery for a very specific customer which needed to be perfect. As a result, this customer would only deal with me. I called the office and spoke to the owner. I declined the offer of a zero hours contract and said I would be leaving. She then said she was giving me my two weeks notice, and I declined her offer of two weeks notice. I informed her that if I was being fired for gross misconduct, then surely I cannot be relied upon to safely deliver the product. Therefore, it would be best for everyone involved if I didn't return to work. She panicked and said that she needed me for those two weeks. I feigned ignorance and let her know that I was just thinking about what's best for the company. After all, you can't have unsafe staff delivering your product to your customers. However, if she wanted to rethink the gross misconduct accusation, then I would work my 12 weeks notice. These were her options. Zero weeks or 12. And she chose 12. For those 12 weeks, I worked the same way I had for 14 years. I didn't coast. I didn't slack. I didn't badmouth the company on my way out. I continued to train new staff. I continued to deliver the product in my own, personal, exceptional way. I also got in touch with a lawyer who was a specialist in employment law. For those 12 weeks, the owner barely spoke to me. She resented the fact that I knew my legal rights and didn't just believe her lies. She hated the fact that I could defend myself. She was pity. She accidentally dropped my mic in the kitchen, breaking it. Most pity of all, she paid for every member of staff in the office to have a spa day, except me. I was asked to work my day off to answer the phones whilst everyone else was being bambered. Nobody knew I hadn't been invited until they arrived at the spa and I wasn't there. Here is the thing. I'm a big fat bearded guy. I have no interest in a spa day. If she had offered it to me, I would have thanked her and declined the kind offer. But by pointedly excluding me, she was making herself look terrible. For the last two weeks, I was training up my friend to basically take over from me. At the end of the 12 weeks, my final day came around. The owner had nothing planned, not so much as a card after 14 years, two for her. The office assistant manager who had become a friend had got me some presents, but had to give them to me once the boss was gone, for fear of reprisals. The day after my final day, two things happened. The first was my friend who I had been training to replace me quit. He was on a zero hours contract so required no notice. He was unhappy with her treatment of me and he was unhappy that she expected him to do my previously salary job for minimum wage. He hadn't informed me of his plans to leave and I only learned of it when he knocked on my door in the middle of the day when he should have been at work to let me know. The second was the owner received a letter informing her that I was bringing legal proceedings against her for constructive dismissal unfair dismissal. I had arranged this with my lawyer to be delivered the day after my final day. According to the office assistant, she went bail and started crying before leaving the office to call her lawyer. She refuted my claims for constructive unfair dismissal, said it was gross misconduct, tried to come up with some more reasons for firing me, but the truth was that the company was making less money because of her business practices, and I was the highest and only salary. I had evidence that I was a great employee. I had evidence that she asked me to move to a zero-hours contract. She initially tried to deny this, since the gross misconduct fabrication makes no sense if she wanted me to stay. But once my lawyer provided hers with a transcript of the entire meeting along with a copy of the recording, she knew she was crude. Still, she let the case drag on for over a year. 
I think she hoped that the legal fees would lead to me dropping the case. But little did she know that my lawyer was working on a no-win, no-fee basis, while as hers wasn't. She ended up settling out of court. The Aftermath The office assistant who had become a friend quit a couple of months after I left. She hated how I was treated and didn't feel safe working for such an untrustworthy boss. Several former customers contacted me personally to inquire why I was no longer with the company. Apparently, the owner was telling them that I just quit. I informed them that I had been fired for cost-cutting reasons. They moved their business elsewhere. Several offered me jobs. One went so far as to offer me a part-time job and to pay for me to attend college to earn a degree required for them to hire me full-time. This was a lovely offer, but they were one of the customers who were a bit too far away to commute, and I wasn't ready to move. In the end, I found a new job in a different industry where a lot of my skills transferred over, currently earning more than I was, working less hours and for better owners. Her business is floundering. COVID left a new owner desperate for cash. She cancelled orders but refused to refund customers' money, citing an act of God clause in the contracts. The business Facebook and Google reviews have tanked. Most of the staff left. The business is still afloat, but barely.